I would like to thank the organizer of the seminar, Joanna Sirici, uh, Joachim, and Bruno Vallette. Um, this talk is a report on uh, joint work with Mathieu Anel, George Biederman, and Eric Finster uh, for the paper Higher Sheaves and Left Exact Localizations of Infinity Topoi, uh, which you can find in the archive. Uh, I have many slides, maybe too many of them. I think I have something like uh, uh, 27 uh, uh, diapo. Um, so I have calculated that it's two minutes for each diapo. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if I, I, I hope I can do it, uh, but uh, I can certainly do it, but it's the uh, audience, I don't know. Uh, the problem with slides is if I um, flash a slide and I, you have two minutes to read it and uh, two minutes to comment it, it it's just uh, maybe too much. Uh, maybe I should have given you all my diapo before uh, giving uh, this talk because then uh, you can, uh, 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 how do you say wonder? I mean, uh, you can um, uh, look at them uh, while I uh, describe them and you can go back and, you know, it's, it's the problem with the slide. If I flash a slide for two minutes, then it disappear. I mean, uh, it's not like giving a talk on the blackboard, you know, because uh, if you write on a blackboard, it takes a certain amount of time and you can stare at the blackboard for a certain amount of time thinking about uh, what I'm writing. So uh, I don't know, I hope that one day we will find a good way to uh, give talks uh, with Zoom. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit uh, lagging behind in terms of terminology because I think some people are much more skillful than I am uh using uh diapo okay so uh, andre, uh, sorry andre um sorry to interrupt you if i can ask a question so uh, <laughs> since this is the first seminar we're not completely uh, set up with all the formalities but one thing i should ask you is it okay we record the talk is it okay if i we record the talk is it okay uh, well, it's okay. Uh, okay, yes. Sure. I don't know yet what oh, no. will happen with the recording, but I think they will be online at some point. Um, I, I know at least of one person, Frank Neumann in Leicester, who already asked about that because he's in a horrid meeting and he's missing the talk. Okay, in... thanks. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Uh... So in, in principle, uh, I'm okay with uh, recording uh, my, my talk, but I hope I will not uh, say too many stupid things. <laughs> the probability that I can will say stupid things is, is pretty high actually, uh, since uh, I have so many diapo. Anyway, okay, so may I start now? Yeah, I guess I, I can start uh, going through the slides. Uh, so there will be uh, actually three parts. And uh, let's start with the introduction. Uh, so the theory of infinite topoi is very much like ordinary topos theory, um, except that there is no real general notions of shield of sheaf resembling the classical one. And that makes a uh, higher topos theory maybe a bit harder. So um, the goal of this uh, talk is to uh, uh, propose a general notions of higher sheaf. Uh, so maybe I should recall that uh, in an ordinary uh, one topos theory, theory of one topos, uh, uh, there is a notion of a uh, sheaf on, uh, on a small category C. And this depends on the notions of Grudzik topology on C. 
Uh, well, the notion of group topology G is really about specifying for each object, object A of, of the category C, um, a set of monomorphism with codomain, the representable functor RA. Um, and um, these uh, monomorphisms are sometimes called covering uh, Cs. And there is a stability condition that uh, if you have S uh, covering uh, sieve um, uh, of B, then its inverse image uh, should be also a covering sieve for any map between uh, representable. That's a very important condition, stability condition. And then a sheaf is nothing more than a local object with respect to the monomorphism in the collections uh, of covering sieves. Okay, so um, I guess I can go to um, next page. Uh, uh, in the category, in the theory of infinity topoi, uh, we replace the category of sets by the category or the infinity category of space or homotopy types or infinity group words, and uh, we shall denote it by S. And uh, it is, uh, it remains true that uh, every infinity uh, topos E is a left exact localization of the uh, category of pre sheaves um, uh, on a small infinity category C, but the collections of such uh, localization is no longer described by uh, Grudzik topology, so to speak. More precisely, it's not true anymore that uh, a left, left exact localizations of PC uh, is uh, generated by inverting uh, a class of monomorphism. Uh, actually, uh, it was proved in uh, higher topos theory that every left exact localizations of PC, the category of PC on C, is a composite of a topological localization followed by a co-topological localization. Uh, the uh, topological localization of PC can be described by inverting a class of monomorphism, but the cotopological localization uh, inverts no monomorphisms. Actually, uh, the morphisms inverted by a cotopological localization are, um, are entirely made of, uh, the, of epimorphism. So uh, the classical theory of sheaves uh, can be applied to topological localization, but not to the core topological localization. So uh, we shall introduce a notion of sheaf with respect to an arbitrary set of maps in a pre-sheaf category. Uh, and more precisely, uh, more generally, uh, a notion of sheaf with respect to an arbitrary set of maps in uh, some infinity topos E. So uh, first, uh, some convention, uh, we shall be solely concerned with the higher categorical so situation. So uh, we will drop the prefix infinity when referring to an infinity topoi, to infinity topoi and to infinity categories and speak explicitly of one categories and one topoi if the occasion arises. So all limits and co-limits are homotopy limits and co-limits. In particular, all pullback squares and homotopy pullbacks are, uh, are, are push out square and homotopy push out. For example, the uh, unreduced suspensions of a space A is defined by an homotopy push out uh, square and uh, uh, as usual, the n sphere is the n fold suspensions of the zero sphere S0. And S0 is itself, is itself uh, the, um, uh, the suspensions of the uh, empty space, the unreduced suspensions of the empty 
empty space. So I recall that an object in a category E is said to be local with respect to a set of map uh, in E if uh, uh, the restrictions along, along U uh, map UX is invertible for every map U in Sigma. So uh, we write a lock uh, E uh, Sigma for the full subcategory of E spanned by the Sigma lock local objects. And uh, then we come to a pre uh, definition. Um, a category E is said to be presentable if it is equivalent to the category of local object where sigma is, is a set of map in a pre-shift category. And um, uh, in general, if sigma is a set of map in a presentable category E, then the subcategory of a local object is reflective and presentable. Now we come to the notions of modal object, which is a strengthening of the notions of local object. So uh, if you start with a set of map in a topos, uh, for example, it could be a pre sheaf uh, category. We say that an object is modal with respect to sigma. If it is local with respect to every base change of the map in sigma. Well, uh, the collections of base change of uh, maps in sigma is, uh, is, is, is large in general. So it is worth noting that uh, if G is a set of generator, then uh, in the definition of a model object, it is enough to consider the uh, base change uh, uh, along maps uh, having their domain in G. So for example, uh, if G is the set of representable in a precive category, uh, then um, the collections of these uh, base change uh, actually form a set. It's not a class of maps. Uh, and um, uh, we will write mod E sigma for the full subcategory of uh, sigma model objects in E. Uh, now it can be proved that the category of mod E sigma <laughs> is uh, reflective and uh, presentable. Now, just a remark. Uh, the category of uh, model object in a pre category is not arbitrary. It's not, it's a very special kind of presentable category. It's not a tropos <coughs> in general, but uh, it is locally uh, carries and close, for example. And uh, maybe we should give it a name. Uh, I'm tempted to call that uh, a category of this type a paratropos. Uh, because it is close to be a topos, maybe it should be called a quasi topos. So, for example, a one topos is a paratopos in this sense. A one topos, I mean a growth zig topos in the usual sense of the word, is a paratopos. Uh, and actually, uh, Lurie uh, introduced the notions of n topos, and any n topos is a paratopos. So, um, but uh, I will not say uh, more than, uh, uh, than that about uh, the notions of paratopos or quasitopos. Now, um, we will need the notions of iterated diagonal. Uh, the diagonal of a map uh, in a topos E, for example, in a pre sheaf uh, topos. Uh, is uh, defined uh, using uh, the uh, Faber product of uh, uh, A with itself over B. Uh, and we can iterate this construction. And um, 
Uh, this is defined the iterated diagonal. The zero diagonal of U is just U itself. Uh, in order to understand what uh, it uh, what this means, it is worth considering uh, the a diagonal of an object x in the topos. Uh, this is just the map from uh, x into the exponential of x by a, uh, and the exponential itself is uh, is the map which is which correspond to the projections of a cross x into x via the adjunction. Intuitively, it is the map which sends an element of X into the constant map from A uh, to X uh, uh, with value this element. Uh, this is just the, okay. So for example, uh, uh, it happens that the n-fold diagonal of the projection from A to one is actually the SN minus one diagonal of A. So, uh, and in general, the n-fold diagonal of a map is uh, is actually a map in the category, in the slice category E over B. So, uh, um, if AB is the fiber of the map U at B, then the n-fold diagonal of U uh, at B is the SN manner one diagonal of AB. Um, I'm making these uh, observation, uh, not that they are very important for my talk, but uh, this is just uh, to give you an idea of what these uh, N fold uh, diagonal of a map uh, actually are, I mean, so, but they are, these remarks are not really that important for my talk. Okay, now the diagonal closer of a set of map is this defined to be the union of all the iterated diagonal of the maps in Sigma. And uh, the notions, if Sigma is a set of map, we say that an object is a Sigma sheaf if it is a model object with respect to the set of all iterated diagonal. And we write sheaf E sigma for the full subcategory of sigma sheaves. Now, our main theorem is saying that uh, um, the subcategory of sigma sheaf is reflective and the reflector is left exact. And in particular, uh, the subcategory of sigma sheaves is a topos. And moreover, the uh, reflector or if you like uh, the localization functor inverts the map in sigma universally among left exact co continuous functors. And the universality uh, um, uh, more precisely, that's the universality of the reflector means that um, a certain number of things. First, the reflector of course is left exact and co continuous and uh, it inverts the map in sigma. And if a uh, left exact co-continuous functor between topoi inverts the maps in sigma, then there exists a left exact co-continuous functor pi prime. Oh, I see here that I made a mistake. Um, phi prime is uh, not a functor from F to the sheaf, but <laughs> it's uh, the, in the opposite direction. So uh, the, you look at the diagram, look, not, don't look at what I wrote. So um, the functor phi prime, it goes from sheaves uh, uh, with respect to sigma to, to, to the topos phi and uh, the triangle commutes. And this phi prime is homotopy unique. That's the universal property of, uh, of rho. Okay, I need a little bit to make a, a corrections to my slide. Okay, now uh, this uh, notions uh, of higher sheaf um, um, just becomes the usual notion when you uh, have a class of monomorphism. It's because um, 
The diagonal of a monomorphism U from A to B is invertible. So uh, therefore, if you if sigma is a set of monomorphism in a topos, then the collections of diagonal of sigma is just sigma union a certain class of monomorphism, a set of monomorphism. It follow that uh, uh, the model object with respect to uh, the diagonal closer of sigma is just the model objects with respect to sigma because uh, every object is model or local with respect to a class of monomorphism. And therefore the sheaves um, as defined before with respect to sigma are just the model object with respect to sigma. And therefore the notions of higher sheaf is equivalent to the usual notions of sheaf when sigma is a set of monomorphism. Okay, now uh, the whole theory uh, that I'm going to present is using, uh, I would say three notions of local object in a topos. First, the usual notions of local object with respect to sigma, and then uh, notions of uh, model object with respect to sigma. And finally, uh, notions of sheave with respect to sigma. So you have uh, these uh, three uh, subcategories. And uh, these uh, three subcategories, um, uh, each one of, of them is connected to a notions of factorization system in the category E. So, the notions of local object is really uh, connected to a general uh, notions of factorization system. And the left class of a uh, factorization system is called a saturated class. So we will uh, define that in a moment. So for each factorization system, uh, it has two classes of maps, a left and a right. And the left class is uh, is a saturated class. In the case of a modality, the left class is, a, 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 is a, an acyclic class. We will define that in, mon in a moment. And in the case of a left exact modality, uh, the left class is, is, is what we call a congruence. So we will now proceed to define this notion. So I first recall the notions of orthogonality between two maps in a category. Uh, this is a classical notion uh, used when we define a, a factorization system. So I will denote this, not, not this relation U uh, perpendicular F or U orthogonal F. And I guess I don't need to say much about that. Uh, we will use a classical not notation U um, uh, exponentiation uh, perp uh, for the class or A uh, exponentiation perp for the class of maps that are right orthogonal to the maps in the A and also um, for left exponentiation for a class of maps that are left orthogonal to the maps in a class B. Okay, now there is a connection between orthogonality and local object because if sigma is a class of maps in the category E and if E is a terminal object, then an object uh, X in E is sigma local. If and only if the map from X to one belongs to the uh, class of maps that are right orthogonal to, uh, to sigma. Uh, well, we will shall see that, but that's the connection between local object and orthogonality. And this is why factorization system arise when we consider local object, model objects, and et cetera. Okay, now I recall what the factorization system is. Uh, it is, consists of two class of maps satisfying uh, 
two conditions which are well known, so I will not say more about it. And it's well defined in uh, Ayurtopo's theory of Lurie. And uh, an example of factorization system is um, consists of the class of uh, surjection in the category of spaces and uh, I would say injections or homotopy monomorphisms in this category. So uh, the left class L is a class of surjection and the right class is a class of monomorphism. Uh, and um, actually there is a notion of surjection and of monomorphism in any topos E and they define a factorization system in E. I need to make a little bit of correction here in my remark. Okay. And uh, each time you have a factorization system in a category, you have a lot of uh, reflective subcategory because uh, uh, if you denote R of B, the full subcategory of E over B was, uh, was object of the maps in R, maps with codement B uh, in R, then the subcategory RB is reflexive. And the reflector takes an object F of E over B uh, to uh, you factor this, uh, this, this, the map F, the structure map of, uh, of this object. And uh, uh, you get uh, in this way a map with uh, uh, um, in R and this define an object in RB. And uh, this uh, operation is actually a reflection of the category E over B into RB. In particular, if E is a terminal object, we obtain a reflective subcategory of E. You see, in many example, R sometimes is a class of fabrication and maybe uh, L is the class of uh, 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 trivial cofabrication or something like that. And um, R of one then is the subcategory of fabrant object in E on uh, the subcategory of fabrant object is uh, reflective or at least homotopically reflective. Okay, now uh, an important notion is the notion of saturated class. Uh, so a class of map uh, L in a presentable category is saturated if uh, the following two conditions all, uh, L contain the isomorphism and is closed under composition. And uh, also L is closed under colimits as, um, as a subcategory, as a full subcategory of the arrow category, because a class of map can be regarded as a full subcategory of the arrow category, I denoted uh, L lower bar underline. And if this full subcategory is closed under colimits, then we say that the class L is under uh, is closed under colimits. Uh, the notions of factorization, uh, I'm sorry, of saturated class defined here is equivalent to the notion of saturated class uh, defined by Lurie. Uh, um, but this is not completely obvious and I, I should have made a reference and I will do that in correcting my uh, slides to a paper by uh, Anel and a co-author where they have first observed that uh, the notions defined here is equivalent to that of Lurie. Lurie is adding a condition that L should be closed under co-based charge. But this is a consequence of the two axioms here. And this is, uh, uh, was first observed in the paper by NL and his co-author. Uh, I will have make a corrections in the reference here. So there is a simplification, a slight simplification. Now there is this theorem that uh, if 
you have a set of math in a presentable category, and you look at the saturated class generated by this set, the smallest saturated, saturated class generated by containing sigma. Uh, then uh, the pair uh, sigma, the, the saturated closer of sigma and the right orthogonal is a factorization system. Well, this is essentially a well-known classical result about factorization system, but uh, uh, well, this formulation maybe um, is not completely standard, but uh, it's, it's kind of a classical result. Okay. Now modality, um, we say that a map is Faberwise left orthogonal to a map. Oh my God, I made a mistake here. I was prepared these slides yesterday. Uh, the, the map F should be from X to Y, not from A to B. Okay. So uh, after making this correction, uh, we may write that U is Faberwise left orthogonal to F if every base change of U is left orthogonal to F. Again, we don't need to consider all base change of U. It's enough to consider the base change of U with respect to maps uh, that uh, uh, with codomain a, a, a set of generator of, uh, of, of your category. So, um, okay. Now, having defined this notions of uh, this stronger notion of uh, orthogonality, uh, we say that, uh, that a factorization system is a modality uh, if uh, uh, you have a stronger form of, of orthogonality between L and R. And actually a factorization system is a modality if and only if its left class is closed under a base change. So that's another way of defining what a modality is. Uh, so for example, in the category of space, the factorization system of n connected maps and n truncated maps is a modality. Okay, now if you have a modality and you look at the left class of a modality in a topos, uh, then uh, what you get is an acyclic class, acyclic class. And uh, an acyclic class can be defined by three conditions. Uh, it contains the isomorphism and is closed under composition, is closed under co-limits. So these two conditions are defining the notion of, uh, of saturated class. But then you add that uh, L is closed under base change. Okay, so uh, for example, of course, the left class of a modality is acyclic. And you have the same kind of theorem as, as before. If you start with a set of map sigma in a topos E, and you look at the acyclic class generated by this set, I call it sigma exponent a, then uh, you get a modality by looking at the pair sigma a, sigma, uh, 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 strong, not strong, but uh, Faber was orthogonal to sigma. So that's an important theorem uh, of, the, of this theory, of the, of the theory of modality. Okay, now having defined uh, mod, uh, mod, modality, let's go to left exact modality. A modality is left exact if the class L, the acyclic class is actually closed under finite limits. And uh, uh, now uh, that's a classical theorem now uh, that has been proved already by 
people in the Motipita theory, actually the notions of modernity was first defined, I think in a Motipita theory, not was not first defined in topology, but uh, in a Motipita theory. Uh, a modality in a topos is left exact, if only if uh, the diagonal of L, the aesthetic, the, the set of diagonal of the maps in, um, in L and the acyclic class L is closed, is contained in L. And then uh, you have also uh, a theorem, uh, which is also well understood in uh, a multiple type theory that uh, a modality, uh, if you have a left exact modality, uh, then uh, the subcategory of a fabric object, if you like, of this uh, modality is a topos and the reflector is left exact. Now, it's therefore very tempting to uh, enlarge uh, the notions of uh, acyclic class or uh, introduce the notions of a congruence uh, in a topos uh, uh, by uh, uh, saying that uh, a map or, or a class of map in a topos is a congruence if uh, it satisfied uh, these three conditions. L should be uh, closed under finite limits in addition to be uh, closed under, under co-limits. So an important example of that, if you take any left exact co-consumers functor between topoi phi, then the class of maps inverted by phi is a congruence as defined above. This is of course very easy to check uh, given uh, the notions of left exact co-consumers functor. What is a bit surprising is that the congruence uh, satisfied the conditions three for two. Uh, this was first observed by Anel and his co-author in their paper on, uh, uh, on uh, small object argument. Uh, and it's kind of very nice. Uh, so I should uh, make a reference to the paper of Anel here. I will correct that. Uh, so it's kind of surprising that these conditions implies that the class L satisfied three for two. Okay. So uh, my, uh, I wrote uh, this preparation <laughs> yesterday night and uh, there are many uh, corrections and reference that I should make. Okay. Now here is the first ingredient of the proof. Uh, if you start with an arbitrary modality in a topos, then you may introduce the notions of R equivalence because you look at the base change functor from the slice categories uh, defined by the map U from A to B. And you say that the map is an R equivalence if the base, the base change functor is an equivalence of categories. Uh, that's a very natural notion to uh, consider. Uh, and actually, we can make it stronger. We say that uh, uh, a map is, in, is a Faber-wise R equivalence if every base change of U is an R equivalent. So let me give you an example of that because uh, I think it's, uh, suppose that uh, Ln and Rn is the modality of n truncated maps and n truncated maps in a topos of space. 
then you can prove that uh, a map U is a Faberwise Rn equivalence if and only if uh, it is uh, n plus one connected. Uh, in other words, uh, these notions of Faberwise equivalence give you the possibility of uh, starting with uh, the modality of n connected map and n plus and n, n, n truncated maps and move to the next modality of uh, n plus one connected maps and n plus one truncated maps. Um, we will not uh, explore that uh, in this talk and we have not explored that in um, our paper. Uh, uh, on higher sheaves, but it will be uh, explored in uh, a paper that we are presently writing on uh, Goodwilly Towers, because uh, it's a, an important aspect uh, of, uh, of the theory of Goodwilly Tower, for example. Uh, but uh, uh, in the present uh, work, uh, it plays an important role. So if you start with a modality in autopos, then we show that uh, a map is a Faberwise R equivalence if and only if the maps U and its diagonal both belongs to, to L. So that's the first theorem. It's not completely obvious. And moreover, uh, the class of Faber was our equivalence is acyclic. Actually, it somehow means that it is the left class of a new, uh, of another modality. So if I, if I put L to the power delta, the class of maps F in L, such that the diagonal is in, is in L, then you get a new modality. This is the left class of a modality. This is the corollary. But uh, this corollary is not in our present paper. It will be the next paper. Okay. Uh, the right class of this new modality is interesting, but I won't talk about it here. Okay, the second ingredient of the proof uh, is uh, using the notions of Grudzik fabrication. Uh, we say that a functor is a Grudzik fabrication if the end use functor between the slice categories is a reflector for every, every object A in E. Recall that a functor is a reflector if its right adjoint is fully faithful. I mean, the right adjoint of, of a reflector is very often the inclusions of a full subcategory. Um, uh, a full subcategory is said to be reflecting if uh, the inclusion functor has a left adjoint. But the left adjoint then is a reflector since the, left, the right adjoint of this, it, it's left, is. The right adjoint of this inclusion, of course, is fully faithful. So uh, that's the notions of a Grudzik fabrication. Actually, this notions of Grudzik fabrication was considered by uh, Ross Street in a paper, and I think the the origin is a is due to John Gray, but I, I am not completely sure of the uh, of the terminology. It is slightly more general than, than the notions of uh, uh, Cartesian fabrications introduced by Dury. Uh, it is actually like the uh, a var a variation. It's, it's invariant under uh, uh, equivalence. Uh, Lurie notion is not uh, no, a invariant under equivalence, but if you make it invariant, you get this, this notions of a Grusik fabrication. Okay, now we observed 
which is it's a kind of a reformulations of Rex this the central principle that if a e is a topos and k is a small category, then the co-limit functor is always a Grozik fabrication in this sense. And uh, the horizontal morphism uh, of these uh, Grozik fabrications are, are the, are the so-called Cartesian natural transformation. This is uh, reformulations of Rex descent principle for a topos. Now the third ingredient of the proof is that uh, is the notions of Cartesian uh, factorization system. Uh, a factorization system is a Cartesian factorization is said to be Cartesian. If the class L has the three four two property and the base change uh, of a map in L along any map in R exists and belongs to L. And uh, uh, if you take any Grozik fabrication, uh, the um, class of, uh, you get a factor, a cathedr a cathedr I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> a Cartesian factorization system from any Grozik fabrication because you have the uh, class of uh, vertical maps, L, and the class of uh, horizontal maps, R. And these two classes of maps, the vertical and the horizontal map, form a Cartesian factorization system. And now there is a lemma, which is useful in the proof that uh, if you have a Grozik fabrication, and if E is a cat category with finite limits, then the functors F preserve certain Cartesian square in E. Actually, exactly the base chains of F Cartesian maps along any map are preserved by the functor F. It's not a very deep theorem. It's not it's easy to prove, but it's very useful in the proof of the main theorem, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is which is this one, right? The main theorem about uh, that the subcategory uh, of sheaves is reflective and the reflector is left exact. So uh, I cannot uh, really describe the proof of the theorem, but I gave you the main ingredient and um, uh, then it's kind of good to have a notions of sight, uh, notions of higher sight. So if you take uh, um, um, the category of pre sheaves on a category C, on a small category C, and you look at the set of representable, uh, we introduce the notions of sight uh, which, and the notions of sheaf with respect to uh, a site. So a site is defined to be a pair C sigma, where C is a small category and sigma is a set of map in the category of precedes on C. And then uh, we can define what, what it means to be for a precede to be a sheaf. Uh, so it is just a local object with uh, respect to every RC based chance of the maps in delta infinity of sigma. And if you look at the category of sheaves on C sigma, this uh, category of sheaves is a topos, uh, and every topos is equivalent to a category of sheaves on the side. Okay, uh, so thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, I think. Uh, I have managed to <laughs> go through all my my uh, diapo, and uh, I will make the correction, and uh, may uh, give you also the bibliography, and I'm uh, ready to uh, answer your questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Andre.
So, are there questions? You can uh, just unmute yourself and ask the question. My talk was so clear that there is no question. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I'll ask a question. Okay, please. Oh, Steve. Hi. Hi, Andre. Um, you had a uh, theorem on a slide, maybe three slides ago, which went by very quickly. You said it was a reformulation of the rest descent theorem. And there it is, the lemma. Yeah. The lemma. Right. right. Could you just explain it a little bit more? Um, yeah, uh, I can try. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, uh, the first thing uh, about uh, a topos is that the co limit. Uh, uh, functor, I mean, if you take the co-limit of the diagram, then co are stable under base change. Mm -hmm. So uh, the base change has something to do with, uh, you have this co functor and you can uh, uh, pull back a co and pull back the uh, diagram. Diagram. Uh, that giving rise to the co-limit, it can still a co-limit. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is part of the axiom of what a topos is. And you can see in this condition that uh, it is kind of saying that a certain natural transformation is Cartesian, mm -hmm. uh, but a uh, natural transformation between two diagrams. So, yes. uh, um, the usual way of explaining uh, what a Grunzig fabrication is, is to say that uh, if you have a, a map between the value of the functor, then it can be lifted into a Cartesian natural transformation. Yeah. And if you just look uh, at this, well, this is just fit together. And uh, uh, actually you're looking at uh, the Rex, the descent principle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is not really a theorem. This is just a reformulation of yeah. Rex descent principle in the language of a Grunzig fabrication. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's a very nice observation. Okay. Now, uh, as such, uh, the observation maybe becomes useful because when you have a Grudzik fabrication, you get the factorization system on the domain of the Grudzik fabrication. You have the vertical arrow and the horizontal arrow. So you have a uh, uh, factorization system there. And this factorization system is very special because it's a Cartesian uh, factorization system. And Cartesian factorizations have some special properties. And this is how uh, we get to this lemma here. Uh, uh, um, the F Cartesian maps are exactly the Cartesian natural transformation. Now you can pull back um, uh, and uh, Cartesian natural formation with respect uh, along any natural formation. And it turns out that the functor F, in this case, the co functor will preserve uh, this Cartesian, uh, these pullback. And this is useful in the proof. Uh, and uh, so, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the yeah. question. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if uh, but I don't want to go ahead of anybody else. If uh, well, maybe I can start with one at least. Um, can you comment on the relationship with the well, let's say the old theory where you first have a topological 
localization and then a co-topological one. How, how do you get from your notion to the old notion? Uh, I mean, okay, so um, I guess you would like to know how uh, this uh, uh, factorization uh, happens uh, in this context. Okay, uh, uh, I wonder if Mathieu Anel is around. Okay, I think Mathieu Anel would have been the best person to answer the question. He was there at the beginning of my talk, but he left. Okay. I'm around, although I am around. Okay, okay. Uh, Andre, uh, Mathieu, can you uh, answer uh, the question? Okay, let, uh, okay. It's a bit difficult to explain it without writing something, but uh, so uh, if you look, uh, so the, the, the result that we have is that from a, a class of, uh, an arbitrary class of map, we generate a congruence. So a congruence is the class of maps that are getting inverted by a left exact localization. Now we can, within this congruence, we can take all the monos and, and then we can uh, invert those monos. And uh, so this is the topological part of the congruence. And then uh, if those monos generate the whole congruence, it is a topological, it is a topological congruence somehow. And if not, uh, there's some residue, some maps that are in the congruence that are not inverted when we invert the monos. And, and those ones, they're gonna generate a co-topological localization after the topological localization. Okay, so for some reason, these other maps are automatically epi? Uh, yeah, they become, they become infinitely connected uh, after the topological localization. After the first localization, I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I also have another question. Uh, is every Cartesian factorization system, does it appear as the vertical horizontal of a Kortenlich vibration? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, good. Uh, actually, that's a good question because uh, the notion of uh, Cartesian ca uh, factorization system was uh, countered by Lanari. Uh, and uh, they actually give a correspondence between Gruzic fabrication in their paper, it's in my reference, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, a Cartesian factorization system. But they need to put some extra condition that the codomain category has a terminal object. And actually this is, this is not necessary. Uh, if you take any Cartesian factorization system, the left class uh, satisfy 342. And uh, you can uh, invert universally the maps in the left class of a Cartesian factorization system. And you have uh, uh, a functor from the category E, the domain, into uh, uh, this uh, localization category. And this functor turns out to be a Grosnick fabrication. And if you look at the horizontal and vertical maps of this Grosnick fabrication, you get back the original factor Cartesian factorization system. So uh, okay. any uh, Cartesian factorization system is actually obtained from a Grudzik fabrication. Uh, and this Grudzik fabrication, you can construct it by inverting the maps in the left class. Okay, nice. It's kind of funny that uh, this result is not true if you consider one category theory. I mean, even if you go to the streets notion. It's because the 
um, um, when you invert uh, the maps in the left class, you get an infinity category. And if you uh, collapse this infinity category to a one category, the theorems that you want to prove becomes false. Oh. You have to stay within the uh, uh, localizations in infinity category theory if you want this theorem to be true. And it's probably why this theorem was never proved in one category theory because it's false in one <laughs> category theory. But if you uh, do it in infinity category theory, it, it's true. But we have not uh, uh, proved this in our paper. We just uh, stated as a remark in our paper. But uh, someone should prove that uh, in infinity category theory. Maybe Lanari should prove that. OK, nice. I, I have a question which is uh, closely related. Oh, Clemence. Uh, bonjour, André. Uh, En fait, justement, ce, uh, I'm sorry. I no, you can say it in French. Uh, justement, ce théorème de, disons, sur les systèmes de factorisation cartésienne me rappelle un, théor, un autre théorème qui est assez connu de Cassidy, Hébert et Kelly, uh, qui caractérise certaines sous-catégories réflexives euh, aussi par rapport au système de factorisation qu'ils qu induisent. Et je pense qu'il qu y a certainement la, la, la propriété 2 sur 3 et il y a aussi la propriété que, euh, que, les, que la classe a droit que la que la classe à droite a des propriétés de stabilité assez importantes. Maintenant, je ne sais pas si la classe à gauche doit aussi être stable par, par produit cartésien. Ça, je ne sais pas, mais il y a, il y a une, une correspondance bijective entre ce qu'ils appellent des systèmes de factorisation réflexifs et certaines catégories réflexives. Euh rappelle beaucoup ce théorème en tout cas. Euh, tout à fait. En, en fait, euh, je, je dois citer euh, euh, Kelly et Hébert euh, euh, sur euh, ça, parce que euh, les, la notion de système de factorisation cartésien, peut-être c'est la même chose que la notion de système de factorisation réflexif, ben, mais je dois vérifier. En fait, il euh, euh, y a là euh, peut-être un, une collision de terminologie Et euh, on a appelé ça système de factorisation cartésien parce qu'il y a une littérature, par exemple, la Nari et aussi Myers, qui appellent ça des systèmes de factorisation cartésien. Mais peut-être qu'à l'origine, c'était des systèmes de factorisation réflexifs. Alors, je dois euh, vérifier la, euh, la terminologie et peut-être euh, effectivement. Je Merci. pense que euh, c'était peut-être appelé euh, euh, une réflexion semi-left exact. Uh, uh, I will just repeat my question because Steve Awade uh, asked it. So my question was if there is a relationship between Cartesian factorization systems and what uh, Cassidy, Hébert and Kelly call reflexive factorization systems. And I, it... I think so. I, I think the, the, I should check that, but uh, I, they, they could be the same, actually. Okay, thanks. They, they could be the same. So uh, I don't know exactly why it is called Cartesian. I like Cartesian, the notions of Cartesian factorization system. I like this terminology. Uh, and we had a discussion uh, uh, with Mathieu uh, about this, uh, maybe even a fight and uh, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Mathieu, what is your terminology for Cartesian uh, factorization system? Uh, I, I don't even remember. Uh, okay. But anyway, yeah, no, uh, I agree with you. Uh, the the, uh, the semi-left exact reflexive uh, factorization 
systems. So th th these are the, the, the same thing as Cartesian. I think in the paper of uh, Cassidy, Eber, and Kelly, I don't know if they actually consider factorization systems, consider some reflective subcategories and the left class, but I don't know if they have exactly the, the, the corresponding factorization system. But, yes, but yes, they have. They have. Oh, okay. Okay. It's so a the, theorem. The, the, it's a theorem in that paper. Okay. Then, then, then this is the same thing. It's uh, something between a, a reflective factorization system where the left class would have only the three for two condition and a, a left exact factorization system where the left class would have uh, stability by all finite limits. They have this semi left exact condition. Yes, and this is exactly the Cartesian condition here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, so there seems to be a clash of terminology and uh, I, I like uh, Cartesian uh, factorization system as a terminology, but I should respect the maybe the, the fact, the priority of Kelly and Hebert. Uh, but uh, I, I think I, I need to do my, my homework. Um, I don't remember exactly, but in my paper with uh, David Gebner, we also considered something, and I don't remember if it's the same thing or if it's very close. I mean, it's also in between uh, these notions. Yeah, you, you consider semi-left exact. Uh, semi-left exact. Semi-left exact. But I'm afraid like, maybe we call it something else. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there is some cleanup to be done here, but uh, I don't know how to, exactly how to do it, yeah. Are there more, more questions? Oh, maybe I would like to say that uh, the proof of the main theorem uh, that we have in this paper is just uh, one version of the uh, proof. Uh, Mathieu and his co-author, uh, they have the same theorem in their paper on, uh, on um, uh, small object argument. Uh, and they have a different proof. And actually their proof potentially is, is simpler than our proof. Uh, and so uh, uh, our paper is not the end of, sto of the story about this theorem uh, because uh, uh, I would like to encourage Mathieu to <laughs> write a paper uh, with uh, only this, their proof uh, of, uh, of this theorem because the, 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 it should be shorter and simpler. And also uh, Eric Fenster has also a proof in the multiple type theory. And it, actually it was the original proof. I mean, the proof that we have now, the categorical proof is a categorical versions of a proof uh, by Eric uh, and maybe Mathieu also in a multiple type theory. So, so this this paper is not the end of the story about about the notions of higher sheaves. I expect uh, it will be uh, 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 maybe uh, reformulated and maybe worked out uh, differently uh, by other people. Maybe it in a simpler way. Okay, thanks. So um, maybe that's a nice outlook to end with. Uh, but I mean, if people want to ask more questions, uh, feel free. Otherwise, um, well, first of all, uh, let's thank Andre again. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Uh, and then maybe I can take the opportunity to announce next week's seminar, which is by Amar Hatsi Hasanovic, who will talk about smash products of uh, theories, monoidal theories. And uh, since Amar is here, Amar, would you like to make a one minute teaser for your talk? Uh, sure, yeah, I can do that. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, so yeah, um, 
so uh, next week I'm going to be talking about uh, a recent preprint of mine, uh, which is about uh, relating this uh, uh, construction in categorical universal algebra, uh, which is the, the tensor product of props, um, uh, which kind of extends uh, both the, the tensor product of Levia theories and the boltzmann vogt product of symmetric operats and uh, related to this mesh product of uh, pointed spaces. So in such a way that somehow the two constructions uh, have kind of functorial bridge between them. But I hope that's enough. Of, uh, okay, that's, that's very nice. Uh, that should uh, make everybody show up next Tuesday. Um, okay. <laughs>